So as mentioned today, my topic is going to be on the use of plant diversification and cover crops for pest management. I'm going to mainly focus on the use of this for um, insect management, but I'll talk a little bit about weeds also in the end. And this is an outline of my presentation. I'll briefly talk about IPM, plant diversification and cover crops, uh, the challenges of trying to use plant diversification. I'll provide some research examples, and then I'll talk about plant diversification weed management. I'll give a weed research example. And then I'll end it there. And if there's any questions, you can um, ask them at that time. So I'll start off with the definition of IPM. And you'll see a number of definitions of IPM, but this is one that I like. And IPM is an effective environmentally approach to pest management that uses a combination of strategies based on ecology of the pests. And the key part of that definition is that any strategy you develop should be based on the ecology of that pest. And also keep in mind that there's a combination of strategies out there and sometimes you may want to employ several tactics within the same cropping system. So when we talk about integrated pest management, there are many tools out there. There's, you can combine cultural, chemical, mechanical, biological, genetic practice, and all these can be used for pest management, whether it's insects, weeds, or diseases. So what are some things that could contribute to an IPM program um, distant crop rotation. Everyone is familiar with crop rotation. That should be the cornerstone of any pest management program. Then there's row spacing. You can change the row spacing. Row spacing can have an impact on weeds. It can also have an impact on insects. Organically approved products, of course. And sanitation, such as the strong alternate host that insects, pests may build up on. And also cleaning equipment, such as you go into a field that has a weed problem and you don't have that specific weed in another field, you want to clean that equipment before moving into the other field. Row covers, of course, can prevent insects from colonizing. Then there's natural enemies, whether there's predators or parasitoids, which are wasps that lay their eggs inside of other insects. Um, tillage, tillage can be used as a tool for weed management, but it can also impact insects. And then, of course, there's irrigation. Irrigation, proper irrigation can make that plant grow more vigorous so it can out compete pest pressure, but also irrigation can change the microclimatic condition within a cropping system. If you have high humidity, then you may make some of those insects vulnerable to um, pathogens. You know you have pathogens that also impact insects. And then, of course, one of my favorite is plant diversification. And when we think about plant diversification, there are several tactics within this particular strategy. One is trap cropping, where you plant a crop that is more favorable to the pest and attract it away from your cash crop. Um, genetic diversification, you can grow out different, the same crop but different cultivars within the same field. Um, intercropping, growing two or more crops together. Uh, mixed planting, mixed planting sometimes confuses our insect pests, it sort of camouflages it from the cash crop. Then there's flowering borders. People typically use flowering borders because they're trying to attract parasitoids. Parasitoids, how they enhance their longevity and fecundity, which is how long they live, how many hosts they can attack, it's based on a food supply. And sometimes they can get that from flowering plants. And then there's barrier crops. I'll talk about that. I'll explain that a little bit later. And then, of course, cover cropping. And cover cropping is probably one of my favorites. And you ask why. Well, why are cover crops one of my favorite tactics? Well, one of the things is that if you talk to different farmers, they have different concerns. They may have several concerns within the same field. So you look at this, some may be interested in soil health or soil quality. You may have some interest in weed suppression. Some may say, I want to manage insects in my field. Some may have nematode problems. Others may want soil fertility. So cover crops is one of those things that you can use to address all these different concerns. Sometimes many of these concerns within the same field with the same cover crop species or maybe use a, a cover crop cocktail mixture of plantings. The other thing I like about cover crops, there are several ways to manipulate. And you manipulate a cover crop depending on what you want to get, what benefit you want from that cover crop. So there's all these suppression tactics, whether it's chemical, mechanical, cultivation, natural, you can just, just let it die on its own. And then there's no suppression. Maybe you want to use as a living mulch. A living mulch is a cover crop that lives the entire duration of that cash crop cycle. Then there's various cover cropping strategy. Again, depending on what benefit you want from that cover crop. Green manure, basically you plow it under because you want the nutritional benefit from it. Surface residue, hay mulch. If you leave that surface residue up there, maybe it forms as a barrier to prevent weeds from establishing. And then there's the dying mulch. And a dying mulch is basically a cover crop. 
It lives during a portion of the cash crop cycle and then it just naturally dies which is different from a living mulch. The living mulch is a cover crop that lives the entire duration of that cash crop cycle. And living mulch are, are a little bit tricky because the, it is a living plant, so they can compete with the cash crop. So you have to be tricky when you're using that particular tactic. The other thing I like about cover crops and plant diversification in general is that in many cropping systems, you may have multiple pest complexes. You may not just have a problem with weeds. You may have a problem with insects, diseases, such as nematodes. And with a cover crop, sometimes you can choose one particular species or a mixture of species where you can suppress all these different complexes, pest complexes, within the same field. But there are some challenges associated with this particular tactic. One, there is additional cost because now you're growing another plant besides your cash crop. Farm become more intricate. What this means, it becomes a little bit more tricky because now you're trying to take care of two different plant species or three different plant species best versus just the cash crop itself. <clears throat> also, additional plants can serve as a sink for natural enemy. Many people say you increase the plant diversification within your field and this brings in more natural enemies, a diversity of natural enemies, and that's true. But sometimes that additional plant can be more attractive, so it attracts natural enemy away from your cash crop. Also, this particular strategy of using plant diversification, it reduces pest population, but it doesn't eliminate them. So if you have a very sensitive crop that only can, re can only handle a, a, a low level of pest, then this may not be the appropriate tactic. And also, there are many studies out there that have shown that plant diversification works well. You can, can get reduction in weeds, you get reduction in insect pest pressure, but it doesn't always result in increased yield or greater profits. Other difficulties is sometimes it attracts pests. It may attr because the pests, there may be something in that, that additional plant that pests may like, so it may attract them to the system more than you would normally receive. Also, there's no set recipes with respect to how you sh should incorporate plant diversification within a cropping system. If you think about a pesticide label, everything that you need, when to apply it, how much to apply it, how often to apply it, it's on a label. But for plant diversification, there's no recipes out there. Another thing is additional plants can compete with the crop. That's why I said it's the danger if you're trying to use plant diversification with another living plant. It can compete with the crop because they're looking for similar resources in some instances. Other thing is, like I said, many times people use plant diversification to enhance the number of natural enemies into the system, but it can also hide pests away from those natural enemies. In this particular instance, here we have an aphid, and there we have a coccinella. So we have this coccinella that's trying to find this aphid, but if there's enhanced diversification there, he may have a difficult time finding that aphid. Not only that, we increase the overall natural enemies. So we may even invite a natural enemy that's gonna come out and take care of the one that we want to protect. So now I'm gonna give some research examples. And I'm gonna start off with some work that I did in Hawaii. And in this instance, we were trying to use protective plants. We were trying to use plant diversification as a way to protect plants. Now, I mentioned protective plants earlier. And protective plants are basically plants that you grow for the sole purpose of trying to protect your crop from an insect transmitted disease or insect transmitted plant impairment. So in this instance, the crop that I was interested in was squash. And in Hawaii, squash is vulnerable to three insect pest complexes and all of them are assembly damaging. All of them can equally ruin a crop. So one I was interested in is aphids. And the reason why aphids are problems, can be a problem, is because they can transmit viruses to plants. And they specifically, very, um, they transmit virus to zucchini plants. In addition to that, you have immature white flies. Immature white flies can feed on zucchini plants and they can cause this, it's a phytotoxemia. It's not really a disease, but it's called squash civil leaf disorder. Basically, immature white flies, they feed on the plant. In response to that feeding, the plant turns this civil appearance. When it turns that civil appearance, it has a problem with photosynthesizing, so the plants are stunted and they don't yield as much. And then another pest in Hawaii that's very notorious is the melon fly. And the melon fly lays its eggs inside of the fruit. 
and basically the eggs hatch and you have a maggot inside that's seeding inside of the fruit. And in some instances, they would just lay their eggs directly into the plant. And when they lay it in the plant, again, it, the maggots, it hatches out, it, it sort of bores through the plants, and then your plants just sort of die over. So the plant I was, in, I was interested in sort of add to this system with squash was sun hemp. And the reason why I was very interested in sun hemp, because it was an extremely popular cover crop in Hawaii. All the farmers there knew about sun hemp. And one of the reasons why it was so popular in Hawaii is that Hawaii has a terrible root knot nematode problem. And sun hemp is a little path to root knot nematodes. So basically they would grow it on lands that is infested with this nematode, then they till it under, and basically it would just kill off the root knot nematodes. But I was interested is could there be some pest suppression benefits other than nematodes? So I set up this four treatment study. One was the zucchini grown in monoculture, which is generally the way farmers grow it, um, intercrop with okra, and then I interplanted with either buckwheat, sun hemp, or white clover, depending on the location in which I did the study. And then there was various sampling technique where we looked, count the number of insects below the plant on the foliage. We used cork borer samples, and the reason why we had to use cork borer samples is because the immature white flies are so small, you can't really count them on the leaf, so you have to take samples back and put it under the microscope. And then we use these little bowl traps. And the idea of these bowl traps, we were trying to see if we got a reduction in the number of aphids entering the plots, where we increased the, the, number, the plant species within those plots. So I'm going to start off by showing some results from civil leaf. And again, civil leaf is this disorder it, immature white flies feed on the plants, and that's the plant response. It turns this silver in color. So we rate it on a scale of zero to five. Zero means there's no silver, and five shown in the bottom right corner means the plants are completely silver. And these plants really have problems photosynthesizing. So this is the results from one of those studies, um, one of the field seasons. So here are the four treatments. Again, this was zucchini. And this was in, um, grown in bare ground, in a crop with okra, or interplanted with buckwheat or sun hemp. And then we took these readings on two dates. And again, um, I'm sorry, on three dates during the season. And again, this was on a scale of zero to five. And then at 36 days after planting, that was the last date we took the read, and mainly because after that point, the, the incidence of virus was so high that we couldn't rate the civil leaf. And basically what we showed here is that those zucchini plants that were interplanted in the sun hemp had the lowest civil leaf rating on all three of those dates. But the other thing to point out is to look at buckwheat. Civil leaf rating was actually highest in buckwheat. So that shows you that plant diversification, depending on the plant that you use, you can get different response. Now let's take a look at how it worked with respect to disease incidents. And I remind you, disease is caused by these aphids. The aphids feed on the plants, they transmit the virus to the plants. So here on the x-axis, this is the days after zucchini was planted. And this is on the y-axis, percentage of symptomatic plants, or the percentage of plants in those different treatment plots where it had disease symptoms. Um, basically, you see the white line, that's the percentage of plants with disease in the bare ground, or zucchini just grown in monoculture. And then the green is zucchini intercrop with okra. Um, gray is zucchini inter interplanted with the sun hemp, and in the bottom line, yellow is the zucchini interplanted with the buckwheat. Now the graph seems a little bit confusing, but it's, the take home message is, you just look at that white line. The white line is all the way on the top. That's the bare ground. So it looks like no matter what plant that we added to that zucchini system, we got a reduction in the incidence of virus. It sort of slowed it down. Then we were also interested in would the intercropping work as well as the cover crops. So the green represents the intercrop, which is the zucchini intercrop with okra, and then the gray and the yellow are the cover crops. So the cover crops work the best. Then we were interested in within those cover crops, which one worked the best? And you can see the yellow line there, which is the zucchini intercrop with the buckwheat. The buckwheat worked the best. So we saw something very interesting in him. The buckwheat did a terrible job protecting those plants from the squash civil leaf disorder, but it was the best with respect to pr protecting those zucchini plants from this aphid transmitted virus. So when we look at those different pests that we were trying to control, with respect to white flies interplanted with the sun hemp, we did get a reduction of squash civil leaf disorder. 
aphids, we got a lower incidence of virus. Now, the one particular pest I didn't talk about earlier, I mentioned melon fly was also a terrible problem there. Well, one thing we know about the melon fly is it's a very good searcher. You can't use plant diversification on it. It's going to find a plant. But there's a weakness in the melon fly. The melon fly likes to hang out on tall plants. It will only come in the system basically to lay eggs. So basically what we did was we surrounded the whole study plot with a taller plant. That's Sudan grass. So they would go there to hang out on the Sudan grass, and then we would spray the Sudan grass with a product called GF120. And this is an organic product. So basically it sort of attracts them, they go to feed on it, and then it kills them. So now when I came to Maryland, I had a graduate student, Jermaine Hines, who was also, he was familiar with the work that I did in Hawaii, and he was interested in seeing how well this sun hemp will work in Maryland, where the insect pest complex is different. So he set up a more simpler study. He just looked at the sun hemp interplanted with the zucchini, such as this, and then the other treatment was just zucchini grown in bare ground. So he was more interested in cucumber beetles, both the striped and spotted cucumber beetle, but he did counts of everything that sort of landed on the plants. So here on the x-axis, this is the days after planting, which is the days after that squash was planted, or zucchini. And this is the number of striped cucumber beetles. So again, the two treatments is that solid line represents the number of those cucumber beetles that was on zucchini in the bare ground, and the dashed line in the sun hemp. And this particular study, he did it over three years and did it at two different locations. This is, shows the results from one of those years at this Queentown location. And basically what he saw was somewhere between 21 and 28 days after planting, that's when you start seeing high cucumber beetle numbers on the squash plants. And we saw a similar pattern at the other site, which was Upper Marlboro, and this was similar um, the initial two years of the study. So now if we look at the spotted cucumber beetle, now the previous that was striped, we look at spotted cucumber beetle, and we pretty much see the same pattern here. Um, again, that dashed line represents the number on the squash plants in the sun hemp, and the upper bar is the um, bare ground. And again, somewhere between 21 and 28 days after planting, that's when we started seeing higher numbers on the squash plants in the bare ground system. Now, we were also interested in spiders. And you say, why are we interested in spiders? Well, one of the things we know about cucumber beetles is they have this anti-predator behavior. They absolutely hate spiders. They despise spiders. If there are spiders on a plant, then they would leave that plant. They're so sensitive to spiders that if you put spiders on a plant, you remove the spiders, and then you put cucumber beetles on the spiders, they will still leave, leave that plant because they know that the spiders were there and it could, could still be there. So here on the x-axis, again, we have days after planting. This is the mean number of spiders per squash plants. Again, that solid line represents the number of spiders we found on squash plants in the bare ground. And striped line, number of spiders we found on squash plants in the sun hemp. And then you can see here, around 21 days after planting, that's when we start seeing higher spider counts on the squash plants in the sun hemp. Now, one of the things we had a problem with was yield. And I warned you, when you're working with a living plants, you can have problems with yield. So we did have a problem with yield. The yield was, although we got good pest suppression, the yield was lower in that sun hemp plot. So we changed things around the final year of the study. And basically what we did was, we went in and we flare mold. Before we clipped it with our hands and we said, you know, we're gonna go at the beginning and basically flare mold. And we flare mold around 20 centimeters. And once we flare mold, it never probably reached a height greater than 25 centimeters. Now, there was a problem with that. We lost some of our insect pest suppression benefit. Actually, we got a different response with respect to the striped cucumber beetle. Now we found there was higher numbers on the squash plants in this interplanted with the sun hemp compared to bare ground. But we said that's okay because right now we're more interested in getting that yield up because that's the most important thing. So this particular table here just shows the bean fruit yields of the zucchini grown in those two habitats. And this is, um, shows the Queenstown and Upper Marlboro site. Um, this is in kilograms per hectare, sort of fancy metric system. But let's just focus on the remarkable yield because that's going to be the most important. 
And now let's look at the Queenstown site, which is on the left here. And we can see that when we made that change, we actually got higher yield in the Sunham plot. Now on the Upper Marlboro site, um, yields were similar, but we didn't get that reduction. So the question is, what was the mechanism? Why did this plant diversification work? So let's start back, go back to Hawaii, where we saw there was a lower incidence of squash civil leaf in the Sunham plot. And the thing about um, these immature white flies, they do more damage on plants that are smaller. So what we found was that the leaf size, the size of the leaf was much larger in the sun hemp plots. So that's why when we did our white fly counts, they were similar in all the plots, but the leaves were, small, were larger in the, in the crop plot. So that means it can withstand a higher population of these immature white flies and not turn silver. And the question is, why were the leaves larger? Well, one of the things is, is that that sun hemp sort of formed a windbreak. In Hawaii, they have these trade winds all the time, it's constantly. So plants in Hawaii, they tend, the young plants tend to grow much slower. But this sun hemp sort of formed a windbreak, so it protected those plants, so those plants just took off. The plants, you notice, remember, it, the plants did terrible in the buckwheat. Actually, the plants were smaller in the buckwheat. And we probably could have corrected that. Basically, we had that, sort of that buckwheat that was planted, it was kind of wide. We should have just narrowed that strip a little bit. If we narrowed that strip a little bit, we probably could have got the same benefits and we wouldn't have got that competition between the buckwheat and the squash plants. The other thing you may have remembered is that there was a lower incidence of virus in those plants that was interplanted with either the cover crop or the okra. And the reason why this happened is we predicted this is what we call the virus sink hypothesis. So I should back up. Remember I had those little white containers in each of those plots and it could tell me how many aphids were land in the plots. What we found is the number of aphids that were actually land in the plots were similar in all those different treatments, whether it was grown in bare ground or whether it was in the crop with okra or, or, or grown with the cover crop. But what made the difference is, is what we call this virus sink hypothesis. So the way this works is you have the aphid. And the aphid will go and pick up this virus particle from feeding on a plant. So that little red dot, that's going to be my virus particle. So now the aphid is flying looking for a host plant. And we're going to say a squash. But what we have is that squash plant is bordered by a companion plant, whatever that companion plant is. So an aphid doesn't know its host plant before doing a test probe. So it lands on that companion plant and it does a test probe. And then that, basically that virus particle wipes off its mouth part. These virus particles are not ingested inside, it's just on the mouth part because it's a non-persistent virus. So basically they wipe that particle off on that companion plant when they go to probe it. And the trick is that companion plant doesn't host a virus, so the virus just dies. So now when they go into land on the squash, they can no longer transmit that virus. So we tested this in the lab, so all the different crops that we, the different additional plants that we used in the field, okra, the clover, um, buckwheat, sun hemp. We just tested this concept in the lab where we allowed the aphid to first land on that cover crop and then go land on the squash plants. And we found they did lose the ability um, to transmit the virus. What was interesting is the plants that worked the best in the lab was also the ones that worked best in the field. So we sort of got a correlation there. Now what about cucumber beetles? What we kept seeing was in the cucumber beetles somewhere between 21 days after planting, we always got a reduction of cucumber beetles on the squash plant in a crop with that sun hemp. And we think it was a reduced tenure time. The cucumber beetles, they had no problems finding those squash plants. They were always landing them always similar numbers, but then somewhere between that third week, they start leaving. So I think it was reduced tenure time. One half could have been the spiders. One of the things I said, they, they don't like spiders, so when those spiders started showing up in heavier numbers, they probably started leaving. The other thing from the literature, it seems that when you interplant squash or some other plants with another plant, it changes the microclimatic condition just a little bit. It's unnoticeable to us, but cucumber beetles notice it, and they tend to don't like those conditions. 
So then I moved to a different system. I moved to eggplant. And this one I was interested in looking at a winter cover crop. So the question was, I was asked was, can crimson clover be used as part of a solanaceous organic IPM program? And the solanaceous I chose to work with, with eggplant. And I was interested in those two pests that are circled in red, the uh, Colorado potato beetle as well as the flea beetle. Both are defoliators. So in this particular instance, I used the crimson clover as a dying mulch. Remember a dying mulch is that cover crop that doesn't live the entire duration of the cash crop cycle? So the idea was that I would plant the eggplant into this crimson clover and I wouldn't have to do any suppression because it's just going to die on its own. So this just show, shows the eggplant and the crimson clover a little bit later and you can see that the crimson clover has almost completely died out. And then I also grew the, the eggplant into a bare ground treatment or monoculture. The other thing I did was this was a split plot experiment. So there was two treatments, eggplant grown into the crimson clover dye and mulch and eggplant grown into bare ground. But then I divided those plots into half. Half received organic insecticide application and the other half received no treatment. The reason why I did this, I was interested in one, if someone chose to use an organic insecticide to try to control these two pests, and someone just said, I'm going to just try to grow it in the crimson clover, who would get better insect pest suppression? The second question was, what about using a combination of the crimson clover and the organic insecticide? Would you get even better pest suppression than using either one of those alone? So here, this days after eggplant was planted on the x-axis, and this is the mean number of Colorado potato beetles per eggplant. And I'm going to make this graph um, simple for you. So first, the treatments again was the, this is the number of Colorado potato beetle found on the eggplant in the crimson clover, represented by the yellow lines, and in the bare ground, represented by the white lines. So again, this was split plot. So the dashed lines represent those that receive no insecticide during the season. So the bare ground white dashed lines, no insecticide, crimson clover, dash, yellow dashed lines, no insecticide. Those little blue arrows there, they just indicate the dates that those insecticides were applied. So to, simple, to make this simple, let's just first focus on the yellow lines. The yellow lines represents the number of the Colorado potato beetles that we found on eggplant in that planted into that dying crimson clover. And basically the, the, thing, the two things together from that is one is that the Colorado potato beetle was very slow to colonize the eggplant planted in the crimson clover. It never reached high numbers. But more importantly, look at those lines. They look almost identical. So that meant that whether we applied those insecticide or not, it didn't make a difference. The Colorado potato beetles were pretty much kept suppressed in that on eggplant and crimson clover. Now let's look at the white lines, which is the bare ground. So first we see that the numbers did reach higher numbers in the bare ground treatment. The second thing, look at the solid line representing where we sprayed. We can see the bare ground plots, they did benefit from those sprays. And look what happened around, I guess that's around 55 days after planting the last arrow. You can see when we stopped spraying, look what happened to that Colorado potato beetles in that plots when we stopped spraying. They jumped right up. Now, again, we had that problem, the problem with yield. I didn't expect to have this problem with yield, mainly because I planted into a dying mulch. It's a dying cover crop. It shouldn't compete with eggplant, but we had a problem with yield. So what I did the ne next year is I went in and I made these strips. So you can see these little bare ground strips in there, and that was to let that soil heat up. So basically, other than making those strips, I still planted into that dying crimson clover. But the thing you may notice is that, is that that entire area is surrounded by crimson clover. So even those strips doesn't, don't come all the way out to the end, and that's mainly because my concern was the Colorado potato beetle. Having that barrier around there means it would take a longer time for the Colorado potato beetle to find those eggplants. And with respect to pest suppression, we didn't lose any, we didn't lose anything. We still found the Colorado potato beetle adults, the immature stage, as well as eggs were significantly lower on eggplant in the crimson clover compared to the bare ground. 
But we were more interested in yield again because that's what we had a problem with the first year. So here we shows the eggplant, the different treatments, and this is markable yields. Again, this is in the fancy um, metric system. But again, the yellow bars represents the yields of eggplant in the crimson clover, the white in bare ground. So when we made that move, we found that there wasn't significant difference between yield in the eggplant and the crimson clover, represented again by the yellow bars and the white bars. But we saw a similar pattern that we saw with respect to insects. And let's focus on the yellow side first. So again, the yellow, the um, dashed lines with that pesticide tank, those are the ones that received the organic insecticide. So with respect to yield, whether we use those insecticides or not, it didn't make a difference. The yields were similar. Actually, the yields were slightly higher in the unsprayed plots. Same thing we saw with respect to insect response. Now let's look at the white bars, look at the bare grounds. Again, you have the unsprayed, it's the solid white, the slash dash whites with the pesticide tank, it's the spray. You can see in the bare ground, it benefited from those sprays. We got a significant bump in yield by spraying those bare ground plots. And then even if you look at the unsprayed plots, the white bar, unsprayed bare ground, compare that to the unsprayed crimson clover, you can see the unsprayed crimson clover did much better. So now let's talk about the mechanism. What was the mechanism? Um, let's talk, first start with Colorado potato beetle. Why did we get lower numbers? Well, one of the reasons is we found that there were a higher number of predators. And some of these are predators that specifically target immature stages, the egg stage, larva stage, adult stage of, lar of the Colorado potato beetle. We did find there was higher ratio of natural enemies to Colorado potato beetle prey in the crimson clover. The other thing, as you may have noted just from looking at the graphs, is that Colorado potato beetle was extremely slow to colonize the eggplant in that crimson clover. So by the time it found those eggplant, the natural enemies had already moved in, so that's why it never reached high numbers. I didn't show any data from the flea beetles, mainly because of time constraint, but the first year there wasn't any significant difference. The second year we actually did get difference. We found that there was a lower number of flea beetles on eggplant in the crimson clover. Now, based on what I know about flea beetles, there's no reason why that should have happened. The flea beetles are very good searchers. They can easily find their host plant no matter what you surround it by. That's just their biology. So actually, my interest with planting the crimson clover was that the flea beetles do most of their damage during the early part of the season because the damage is really small. So that's these little shot hole damage. But it's during the early part of the season when the eggplant is growing is small and growing slow, they can cause a significant amount of damage. So my purpose of, one of the reasons why I chose the crimson clover is I was hoping that it could benefit from that nitrogen addition, natural nitrogen in the soil and that they would grow much rapid or during the, um, during the um, early part of the season. And it wasn't because I thought it would, would mask it from the um, flea beetles. But for some reason we got lower numbers. So if you ask me why, I would say we just got lucky. There's no reason why they, we should have had lower numbers. So then this was another study we just recently did. And, and for this one, I'm not going to really show any data, but it's kind of showing the philosophy of, of how you go about trying to choose a plant species. For this one, the title of this project was Multitasking Marigold to Strengthen Organic IPM in Lyman Bean and Other Bean Crops. So we know that beans are impacted by a complex of pests. It ranges from disease, plant disease, to nematodes, to insects, you're also battling weeds. But the two that we were mainly interested in were nematodes and the Mexican bean beetle. So the first thing the objective was to try to develop an ecological strategy that could be used to manage the Mexican bean beetle, which is feeding above the plant and these root knot nematodes, which are attacking the roots below the plants. So remember, I remind you that definition of IPM. One of the key points of IPM is learn as much as you could about the biology of that pest. So that was my first task, is trying to learn something about the biology of these pests. And in doing so, I'm trying to find a weak link, something that I can exploit. So I started looking in the literature. And basically what I found, RKN, with respect to root knot nematode, is they're not very mobile, which is something I already knew. Also, they're very vulnerable to allelopathy. There are many plants out there that release toxins that are allelopathic to them. For instance, sun hemp, which I talked about earlier, is very allelopathic to root knot nematode. 
And then the Mexican bean beetle. The Mexican bean beetle, I found they favor certain plants over others. The other thing is, the literature seems to suggest they dislike the odor of some plants. So based on that, I could try to get an idea of what plants I needed to plant with those lima beans to try to protect them. And I chose to work with French marigold and wax beans. Kind of a strange combination. But I chose French marigold because one, French marigolds produce a compound that is toxic to root knot nematodes. Also, it was predicted, it was one researcher in the literature said that the Mexican bean beetle is repelled by the odor of French marigold. So that's why I chose to work with French marigold. And then I chose wax snap beans. So why would I choose wax snap beans also to go in that system? Well, one of the things is the literature showed that the Mexican bean beetle favors snap beans over lima beans. And lima beans is the crop that I'm trying to protect. The other thing it says, they specifically like wax snap beans. That's one of their favorite foods. So based on this, I came up, I can use this, this new concept. And this concept is called the push-pull. Has anyone heard of this concept, push-pull tactic? So the idea here is that you can grow a plant, and it's different strategy, but we're going to talk about the plant concept. You can grow a plant where one plant in that system is basically repelling the insect. So that's the push plant. And then you have another plant in the insects which is luring them, like a trap crop. So in this instance, I felt that I could try to use this French marigold and this wax bean as a push-pull system. But I could get additional benefit out of the marigold because if there's root knot nematodes in the soil, they're also going to be suppressed by it. So the objective was to quantify the impact of this push-pull system on arthropod pests and natural enemies, root knot nematode infestation, and yield. And we just did this study this past summer and still going through the data. And this is the setup where we had. And we did this study in um, um, University of Delaware Research Station. And it consists of two treatments. First, there was just lima beans grown in monoculture shown by those little white circles. And then we had the lima beans in a crop with the marigold. The little green boxes represents marigold. And then on the side of that, we had our wax snap beans represented by yellow. And the other thing we had in mind was sometimes when you use trap crops, they work too well. You know what I mean by they work too well? They attract so many insects that they basically devour the trap crop. And then what happened? They move over to the cash crop. So we, what we had a backup plan that we was monitoring that trap crop. So if that trap crop was working too well and it attracted too many of these Mexican bean beetles, we were going to hit them with the organic pesticide Azera. So that was our backup plan. So that's what I said about IPM. Sometimes you have to use a mixture of tactics in there. And this just sort of shows what the plots look, out, um, look like. This is just lima beans grown in monoculture. And then here we have the lima beans. You show the arrow there, shows the um, um, marigold. And then this is kind of show the border of the plot. So over on the side there, those are wax snap beans. And I have a zero there, just to remind you that if they got out of hand, we could spray that zero there. And I just want to show this kind of later in the season. This is later in the season. Remember how small those marigold plants look? Look what happened by the time we harvest that plant. Those marigolds look like a solid line, look like we planted a solid row of marigold. And that's one of the problems with marigold, it can really get out of hand. We had a plan for it, but it didn't work out. The plan was we had these little irrigation to it, right? One of the ways you can stop the growth of marigold, you just cut off that irrigation. You can control the size by the irrigation. And it's kind of drought tolerant, so it'll live, but it just won't get big. The problem was last year was one of the most rainiest seasons ever. So it didn't work. So they just got out of hand. So what we did find, tentative, and we haven't looked at all the data, what it looks like is, it looks like the wax beans were attracting Mexican bean beetles, because we did tend to find more Mexican bean beetles on the borders where the wax snap beans were versus the border of the lima beans where we just had lima beans. But it doesn't look like the marigolds was repelling them. Because what we did tend to see were, we did tend to see similar number of marigolds in the center of both plots. 
But we're not sure if that was another problem with using wax beans is that it matures much earlier than lima beans. So we don't know if once it reached that maturity, it was not that attractive, and that's why we started seeing more Mexican bean beater in the center, or maybe it just wasn't working as well. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about weeds. So the question is how can plant diversification aid in weed management? Well, as living plants, they compete for resources such as sunlight, space, and nutrients. And some people say one of the things about using intercropping, they say growing two or more crops in the same field, the reason why you get better weed suppression, that you have more ground area cover when you grow two crops. The idea if you have more ground area cover, there's less places for weeds to germinate. But again, it becomes a very tricky system when you're trying to grow two different plants within the same field. And then also as plant residue, as plant residue, um, and mainly this is in cover crops, it form a physical barrier, preventing weeds from develop, growing, um, intercepting light so it doesn't reach the weeds, lowering the soil temperature. Some weeds are warm season. They need a warm soil to germinate. That residue can make that soil a little bit cooler. Also increasing weed seed predator population. This is something that a lot of people don't know about, that there are carabbits out there that we call seed predators because they eat a lot of weed seeds. You also have some crickets that eat on weed seeds. And one of the ways to enhance their numbers is having um, residue on the soil surface. They tend to forage more when there's residue on the soil surface. And then, of course, we know that some plants are a little pathic to weed seeds, so they don't germinate. So this particular study was interested in examining the impact of cover crops and tillage on weeds and field transition to organic farming. And I'm going to just going to briefly talk about this. So this was a multidisciplinary study, but I'm going to focus mainly on the weed aspects of it. And we were interested in assessing and comparing the impact of two minimum till practices with two conventional till practices on weeds, on the biomass, how much time it cost us in hand weeding, as well as crop yield. So we set up four treatment. We had our conventional till treatment, where it's the bare ground and black plastic mulch. In these, basically you do your, your plowing and your tilling. And then we had our, what we call our conservational tillage, where it's no till versus strip till. And this particular study was done for four years. And we, the first year we did eggplant, then the second year sweet corn, then we went back to eggplant, and then sweet corn again. And all the plots start out with this cocktail mixture of cover crops. And we use a combination of crimson clover, forest radish, and rye. So just to show you what the study sort of looked like early on. So again, we start out with forest radish, rye, and crimson clover. Um, this is probably shows the plots in maybe late November, early December. So you know the rye and crimson clover isn't going to grow much during the fall or winter. They both take off during the spring. Forest radish is different, it takes off. So you look at this plot, there's no evidence, really no evidence that there was rye or crimson clover planted. But then you have three nights, very low temperature, around 20 degrees, and basically the forest radish completely dies off. And then by springtime, there's no evidence of forest radish, but you have a nice stand of rye and crimson clover. And then the first thing we do is we flare mow all that stuff down. And then that's when we start to separate out the treatments. So here in the lower right, you have the bare ground where it's till and plows. There's no evidence of the cover crop there. And in the upper right, same thing, conventional treatment, till and plow, later black plastic, no evidence of cover crop. Then you have the upper left here, no till. Basically, you just mold that, flare mold the um, cover crop and plant the eggplant directly into the residue. And then the strip till. And in strip till treatment, basically, you have that little strip till, two row strip tiller. We use a two row strip tiller. It makes a little zone. It tills a little zone about 10 inch wide, and that's where you plant your vegetable crop. So, just to summarize what we found, we found the weeds were greatest in the bare ground and no cultivation was done. Uh, we found lower weed density in the no till plots overall and the black plastic below the mulch. And basically, what we meant is we didn't have weeds coming up below that black plastic, but in between the rows, in between those black plastic rows in that alleyway, a lot of weeds. 
we did find that the plant growth was slower and yield was lower in no-till than some years, which is a real problem with trying to grow no-till vegetables, especially if they're warm season vegetables, you plant them in the spring, all that residue, that soil is a little bit cool and those plants grow slower. We did find the quality of egg eggplant was best in the strip till. Um, we did find that conservation tillage required less machinery input, but we did find there was very high weed density in the strip till plots. Just in that inter-row area, between the rows were fine, but in that inter-row area, a lot of weeds. So that's what we really need to work on, improving that strip till system. And that's what I want to work on, and we're going to do that, start doing that this summer, improving the strip till. Although we got better results in the no-till, I think we need to improve the strip till because we can get more ecosystem services out of that strip till. And what I mean by more ecosystem service, we can get more benefits from the strip till system than we can with the no-till system. So one of the things, like I said, with the strip till, the first thing we did, we would flare, we plant our cover crop, we flare more, then we make our little strip till, little zone where we're going to plant our vegetable. But we found that there was one piece of that puzzle missing that we think they would improve the system. And that's what IPM is all about. And that's chemical. And I know when we talk about organic agriculture, we shouldn't be talking about chemical, but it's an IPM tool, so we have to consider it when we need it. So the idea here is what we generally do is we go and make those little strips in the crop just before planting the crop, maybe the same day or the day before we make the strip, and then we would plant inside the crop. The problem is when we make out of those strips, we just disturb that soil. So what happens when you disturb that soil? You're going to get a flush of weed. So we were basically disturbing the soil and then planting the eggplant and we're going to get a flush of weed. So what we want to do different with this one is instead of making those strips just before planting, we want to make those strips three weeks ahead of planting. And then we allow those weeds to flush. Just let them come up. And then just before planting, that's when we go in and spray. We call this the stale seed bed technique. The idea is organic herbicides, even if they're effective, they're too expensive. If you have to spray the entire field, it's just too expensive. You lose all your profit. But the idea, if we could limit it to these narrow strips, we're, we're spraying about 15% of the field. And hopefully if we can limit to 15% of the field, we can make it affordable. And then once we spray it, if we don't disturb that soil and then we plant, we shouldn't get that second weed flush. So we should be safe there. But the idea is, even if you get that second weed flush, it should take some time. So by the time you get that second, feed, that second weed flush, hopefully those plants are already large and they develop that canopy. So the idea with plants, cash crops, if you don't get weeds before that canopy comes over, then if they're not established before that, they're not going to get established. The other thing we want to work with for perennial cover crop, why? Because what we find is even in that no-till situation, it does good weed suppression, eventually that, that material breaks down. And when that material breaks down, what happens? You have weeds to stop popping up. But if we can use a living mulch, a low-growing living mulch, it's going to be there the entire duration of that cash crop cycle. So then, so now we're taking care of the weeds in the intra-row area, and we got that cover crop between the rows that's living there, so we shouldn't get any weeds in that area either. The other benefit is that we're going to work with something like a red clover. And we like red clover because it attracts a lot of pollinators, diversity of pollinators. So again, we're looking for something that we can get as much ecosystem services as possible, our, our cropping system benefits. So that's what we're doing this summer. And we also have Shannon Dill involved. And the reason why we have Shannon involved because she's an ag economist. So she can also tell us we may find that some of these systems work better than other, but they may be more expensive. And as an ag economist, she can sort of tell us which one lowers the production cost as well. And then we're also going to be looking at soil health. And the reason we're looking at soil health, we did have some organic growers who are very interested in soil health. And they want to know which one of these treatments will result in the best um, soil health. And what Kuhui does is that she can look at free-living nematodes below the soil. When we think about nematodes, a lot of think, times people only think about plant parasitic nematodes, the bad ones, but there are good nematodes, and we call these free-living nematodes. And they feed on things like bacteria, fungi, some may be feed on algae, they are nivorous. some are even predaceous nematodes. 
So the idea is by looking at the ratio and numbers of those, we can tell how healthy the soil is. So basically what I can say about plant diversification, it, it can be a useful tool in IPM, but it definitely need more research. One is we need to start doing it on commercial farms with farmer participation. We need to know about the economic cost of their adoption. Also the environmental benefits. Sometimes the environmental benefits, the long-term environmental benefits may override the initial additional costs. Also, we need to look at multidisciplinary impacts. This is very important, because if you have a weed scientist who look at this, they're only interested in the weeds. You have an entomologist, they're only interested in the entomology. Soil scientists, only interested in soil quality. But we need to look at all the potential disciplinary impacts of these plant diversification. And also, how to best integrate it with other IPM tactics. And also, greater information is needed in the dissemination of this information. In other words, there's a lot of stuff out there that works that I don't know about, that you guys may not know about. The reason is, some of the researchers, they find some good things, and it never gets disseminated to the public, so it never gets adopted. So with that, I acknowledge some of the grant agency, and I don't know if I have time for questions. Do I have time? Mm -hmm.